So Nate, the Canadian prepper, built this little cabin with uh, the help of me on my property as a little uh, extra kind of getaway thing. And this is the Haven Ultra model from a company called Bunky Life. So I'm going to tell you all of my thoughts. Hopefully I don't get too long-winded, but everything you probably wanted to know or questions that you had on this and a tour in part of this video as well. So stay tuned. So Nate at, uh, well, CanadianPreparedness.com or Canadian Prepper on YouTube uh, got a Bunky Life cabin, the Haven Ultra from a company called Bunky Life. They're a Canadian company. They were on Dragon's Den. And they manufacture these kits to build these awesome little cabins. So this thing kind of goes together like a log cabin and it's got a log cabinish feel there's no insulation in the walls it's just kind of dimensional tongue and groove lumber and you build build it up and literally uh, if we had three full-time days or two really long days we probably could have hammered this off but overall it took the entire process four days for the build and shorter days he recruited me because i used to build houses and um I'm obsessed with super high efficient structures and things. So this was a little bit different project for me. I've never built a log cabin and I've never built one of these bunky life things. Uh, I typically build with dimensional lumber, sheeting, insulated vapor barrier, build high end structures. But this little kind of bunkhouse, it's 10 feet by 10 feet is the footprint and the loft is a little bit bigger. So it's got a second story for sleeping up there. And it's kind of a different build. It was an experience for myself as well. So the first thing we had to deal with is the foundation of it. What do we build this thing on? So the Bunky Life kit comes with, it's essentially just treated two by fours on the flat, and then they give you options of what you can do. So I've seen the, the owner of Bunky Life and some builds where they just like bury in some treated pieces of wood and build it on that, no insulation under there. Uh, you could pour a little concrete pad if you want it completely permanent. You could pour pilings I considered drilling in some posts past the frost line six by six posts like a pole shed just four of them Build it on that. But what I ended up doing is just putting it on essentially patio blocks on packed gravel So we picked this space. Uh, I wanted it the steeper roof facing south and I had this nice little uh, place on my property in one of the pastures um, that's suited for this little thing. So I we used the brush cutter, took down the poplar, all the natural organic material for um, the, the space, put down landscaping fabric on kind of, there's no dead grasses and stuff, just the earth, four inches of packed gravel, and then put down some patio blocks. Now, I considered all the different footings you can you know do it permanently but i actually built this as portable so i can literally come at it from the side with the skid steer well actually my skid steer is probably not strong enough now that it's spread out but the lift of lumber it comes on i can lift and move around with the skid steer um, but you could move this quite easily so i built it as so now this different type of building i'm going to get into some building science here it's it moves around it's going to expand contract move around they left a lot of room around windows and doors for expansion contraction on everything because it's a log cabin like if you build a log cabin out of wood you have to season the wood put it together fill in the cracks as it goes type of thing so i talked to some paint guys and about how to do certain things uh bunky life says you use uh, caulking on some of the joints after it's done and they give you some options for painting and staining but the paint guys I talked to said you know what let it get used to its natural habitat and environment right it came on a lift from a different part of the country came here is built it's going to shrink expand it's going to release all the oils out of the um, out of the wood all the natural oils 
and before I caulk, caulk it or stain it, I'm going to use a uh, penetrating oil stain inside and out. I'm leaving it a full year to let it settle and do its thing. So the walls are going to shrink. It might get a little shorter. It's kind of a kind of a weird thing. But anyways, for the footing, what I did, I checked my code book and I built the footing out of two by six joists for the floor system with a double header front and on the sides for the walls. So Bunky Life in their kit, uh, I believe it was treated two by tens, 12 inches on center. That was overkill. So two by sixes, 16 inch on center was, was this for this span of floor joist. I ended up doing 12 inches on center. Um, so that's the spacing between the joists. And I just used spruce lumber um, for the the base and we built the the main part of the base upside down so spruce lumber and then I sheeted it with OSB particle board and then I put a uh, house wrap on it to protect protect it flipped it over and then I put a double header of treated material on the outside now this is just spruce and my base is is treated so I mean this is spruce and exposed anyways but um, when I flipped it over, so it's got a double header all the way around, treated on the outside, I put it on a 6x6 outdoor wood skid that I use for like pole buildings. So a 10 foot skid, front and back, and that's what sits on the patio blocks. So well, what that did is it made it perfectly square with that sheeting, and then the house wrap protects any like rain splashing up off the gravel from ever touching any of that OSB and mouse proof as well because I did throw in R20 insulation in there no vapor barrier because of the rest of the building it's kind of um, you know it, it, this thing is what is what it is it's meant to be cute Nate call it, hates it when I call it cute but uh, it's meant to be log cabin finished outside inside quick to build you can build it without much knowledge and things and yeah so we flipped it over and secured it to those skids so i can literally come in with a forklift if i want and move the cabin somewhere else or maybe nate buys a property near me which i'm encouraging him to do and he wants this thing well just move it so now on patio blocks uh like here our frost goes down four feet but on a high surface with good drainage and four inches of crushed rock on landscape fabric as well and patio blocks it is going to shuffle it is going to heave a little bit so maybe for whatever reason this this one sinks over the next year and this one raises next year i can literally um with my hand lift it up it's it's hard so i just use uh, i guess a pry bar and then i like using asphalt shingles to shim it up so we started perfectly square and level, and then maybe once a year I come and put a level on the floor and, oh, this corner needs to come up, so like that. But again, why did I do that or not bother with permanent foundation? Foundation, So it's movable, portable, and the rest of the building's going to like move around like a log cabin and shrink and expand and do its thing anyways, and it just kind of is what it is. So after building a perfectly level and square foundation, then you can start on the Bunky Life system. Now, they included treated 2x4s that you put on the flat to secure the tongue and groove to. The way that I built it, I didn't need that, but I wanted to include that because uh, it was kind of a video for Bunky Life as well, like that's what they do. So I did add that, and then you start on your boards and go go all the way up so they include all your hardware super long expensive screws come with the thing and you screw it down through the essentially their two by sixes tongue and groove secure it to the foundation and then hammer them in and it's just a screw kind of front and back and that's it so essentially with my knowledge all that was needed was for all the doing the roof properly which i'll get to and the foundation so if you don't have building knowledge you get somebody to help you it's essentially like building a little deck right and then after that's perfectly square and level i i barely even looked at the instructions i was too busy building it i was just calling for next piece what's the next piece one of the camera guys usually had the instructions 
um, one of Nate's camera guys, and I don't know how much building knowledge they had, but it was super good instructions, almost goes together like Ikea furniture or something, but in a whole cabin. So I would just call for pieces, things like that. There's a few other things that it was good for me to have. So the foundation, once I got up to the second level, I actually had to square it and recheck everything. So I used a strap um, to torque the building because it is kind of wiggly wobbly until it all ties together, right? Um, and then all of the stuff on the roof. So a full day on the gravel base footing and then two days, essentially two partial days, like short days, building the bunkie and then the roof. Now, uh, the bunkie life, it doesn't include any insulation. Um, okay. Okay. I, I, I'm, uh. I'm a nerd, so you watch uh, Nate's video. It's super high quality, quick, the whole thing, but let's talk building science. Okay, I've had ATCO office trailers over the years. Uh, I have one from the 1970s right now. The footing on that, it's essentially a steel skid. So it's uh, the skid is eight by 40 is the outside beams, and then it cantilevers over, so it's 12 by 40 ATCO. How that's built is kind of like this, but I just used a uh, wood 6x6 six six skid. Uh, underneath that ATCO from the 1970s is OSB with no protection on it. The After 50-some years of that ATCO trailer being in existence, the OSB is finally rotting after 50 years, so that's why I use house wrap under there. That ATCO trailer on a steel, steel skid is more solid. It's like jumping on concrete to a near end than any house I've ever built with a wood floor system. And that's portable, so a semi can come and pull it up just like this bunkie I can come with a forklift. Now that ATCO, you can, you can pry it up and shim under it the steel skids if you want, but it st stays, it won't twist too much once it's all tied together, it is what it is. Um, okay, the other building science thing that you're probably super interested in is no insulation in this thing. Why would you do that with no insulation? Well, this is a 10 foot by 10 foot shack with the upper level. If I built a bunkie or a, a little cabin like this with current building science, how I build other things, so insulated, vapor barrier, sealed up uh, windows, spray foamed, it's essentially a new construction, even just your standard uh, construction techniques. It's like you're living in a vermetically sealed bag, okay? But a house is bigger than a little thing. If I built a little house like this and I didn't put an air exchanger in the wintertime and Nate and his family come and they sleep up top and everybody's in this little structure with not a lot of air in it and it's built like a standard house, it's, uh, there's a good chance that they run out of oxygen and get like carbon monoxide poisoning just from breathing at night, okay? So you're sealed up. Houses way back in the day, so early 1900s, how did they build them? So it was two by four walls. Um, they didn't have insulation. They definitely didn't do plastic vapor barrier and things like that. So they're drafty. They're not efficient. They're, they breathe. But you go in those houses and they're fresh. So maybe for insulation in the walls, they put in wood chips and insulation and maybe even bits of cardboard. Same in the attic. Over time in that wall that uh, those wood chips will will settle and then there's no insulation in there. So an old house, it breathes, okay? If that makes sense. It's not efficient, but it breathes. A log cabin, same thing. There's no vapor barrier in a log cabin. It just kind of breathes, right? Okay, now on a little structure like this, again, if I sealed it up, there's like literally a risk you're gonna run out of oxygen sealing in it if I built it like a house. So a little one, without any insulation in the walls, um, it will breathe. You'll kind of get fresh air in there. And now on a little structure like this, that's kind of a good thing. So the heat source with this little guy, if you put in a standard wood stove or a super tiny wood stove, you're gonna cook yourself out of there in minus 40 with no insulation. So how, if I built it 
super efficiently with insulation and vapor barrier like I do other construction on a tiny thing. You would need the tiniest little heat source, but you'd also need an air exchanger, which is standard building code for a house now. Just your standard house, not even a high efficient house. Just They're high efficient enough that you it's mandatory to put an air exchanger in to get fresh air in to a house. So being that it breathes like this, you need a little bit more heat source, but no air exchanger, I would say. So the windows it comes with, I mean, they're cute kind of thing. They're not like super high performance doors and windows and things. I think they build them themselves with the kit actually. So there's not really any point of doing too much insulation. Again, could you insulate this? The purpose of a bunky life thing is to have a finished outside and inside of it. So it's kind of like a log cabin feel. So if you're going to insulate it with rigid insulation inside or outside, it kind of defeats the purpose. Like, look at how these stick out kind of like a log cabin. It is the cutest thing ever. And again, Nate hates it when I call it cute, but it is super cute, right? It's a nice place. It, you walk in, it smells like wood. It's a nice ambiance in there, and it is what it is. So wood does have a R value of about, spruce is about R 1.4 per inch. So on kind of dimensional lumber like this is built out of, the walls are actually about an R2. And just like a log cabin, there's little drafts and, and where all the boards come together and things. So after it settles, I am going to stain it and caulk it. Um, kind of all the joints, so it is kind of sealed up that way, but it does have an R2 value. In the foundation, uh, because I used 2x6 construction, I got 2x6 fiberglass insulation. It was just one bale of insulation that was $90 or $100, and I put that in the floor. I didn't even bother putting a vapor barrier on the floor because the building kind of is, you know, it is the rest of it. It is what it is, right? Um, but that R20 insulation in the floor, that's where all your cold is going to be. Now, in a little thing like this, it's going to be hot up there and cooler down here. It doesn't matter what heat source you do in the wintertime or the summertime. Heat rises. Uh, so the roof. Okay, so they give you a few different options for the roof. You don't have to put any insulation. You can put asphalt shingles. You can put uh, metal on the roof. So I, I chose to go with uh, metal that I use for most agriculture buildings that I do. Uh, it's called uh, Ultravic Gal Galvalum Color. It's cheap, readily available type of thing, and um, that's what I put on the roof. Now the roof is just uh, thinner, I believe it's half inch tongue and groove spruce boards. So it's a finished roof on the inside. Okay, so you, you put the Bunky Life roof on, the tongue and groove, that's your finished surface on the inside. Now, with building science, it's kind of funny, like if I was to build a house, you a house, you do the roof, insulate, vapor barrier, and then a tongue and groove finished, but it's the finished ceiling for the roof. So how, how it works, uh, in the winter time, especially if you're going to run heat in here, there's probably going to be something acting as a vapor barrier. And what it will end up being is the insulation I put on top of the roof. So you have to protect the roof uh, structure, the those tongue and groove boards with something. So I put a house wrap or a roof roof wrap or whatever that lets some air through but stops the moisture. On top of that, I put uh, I, f I figured it was overkill to spend too much money on it and stuff. R3 half inch rigid insulation, uh, foil, foil backed. It was uh, cheaper stuff and it's R3, which I figured you, you uh, match it to the rest of what the structure is good enough, right? Um, so the house wrap protects from condensation coming up and that foil uh, insulation may be getting condensation. So any condensation that comes up, the uh, it's going to be on the insulation and on top of the house wrap, so it protects your wood structure. 
On top of that half inch rigid insulation, I just happened to buy a whole whack of these 12 by 20 insulated tarps that I had. So I figured throw that over, um, gives it a little extra protection. Another thing is the underside of tin is known to condensate as well. So if you're minus 40 outside having a fire in here and, and getting really hot, it's, it could have condensation moisture under the insulation and also condensation moisture under the metal. So if it condensates under the insulation, that house wrap on top of the wood gets rid of it. If it condensates under the um, metal roofing, that insulated tarp will take it down. There's a few different ways. Uh, Bunky Life says you could strap it with um, inch and a half dimensional lumber on top and then fill it with uh, thicker insulation, like inch and a half rigid insulation in between, or you can put rigid insulation down and strap it first with uh, some type of lum lumber, one by fours or two by fours, to give a better nailing surface for the big metal screws to hold the metal on. I decided that insulation was rigid enough in just a half an inch that I just put the metal right on top. There's a bunch of different reasons why I do this. Um, but those metal screws, we had to watch that you don't over tighten those uh, big metal, like they're almost lag bolts with a rubber washer on them. You don't put them on the ridge of the tin, you put them on the flat part and you secure it tight enough so that rubber washer makes a tight seal around the screw to waterproof your roof. This is how I do all my buildings, except my house that's a expensive standing seam and doesn't have exposed screws. So we had to watch you don't over tighten because we'd compress that little half inch insulation and the insulated tarp. So just snug enough that it's sealed around the washers. And it's a steep roof, so we're this, it never have an issue. That roof's good for, I don't know, 50, 100 years, whatever. I don't like strapping a roof with horizontal pieces. Okay, water goes down the hill. If you have a horizontal two by something, that's not treated or anything. Like I said before, there's condensation on the underside of the metal sometimes. When it condensates under the metal and it, and it comes down the darn roof and you have a horizontal piece sticking up, that's a good place for water to pool and collect and rot out your roof. So if I, was, if I wanted more insulation up there, what I would have done is put a small rigid like I did here and then strapped it with two by fours, so inch and a half dimensional. And then in between the two by four strapping, I would have put inch and a half rigid insulation cut in between, and then an insulated tarp or just a roof wrap or, or house wrap or, or uh, whatever, and then the metal on that, and then you get better surface to screw the, the metal into. So being that it's a finished ceiling in here, you like there's no Fiberglass insulation, you can't do that. It's kind of rigid insulation or nothing. And is it worth super insulating the roof when you have, you know, not super high efficient windows, a building that's drafty and just R2 kind of wood walls? It's not really worth putting too much in. Uh, if you have a wood stove down here, it's going to be hot in the loft. And if you put too much insulation up there, I mean, heat rises, so heat to go away. I figured it was more important to put R20 insulation uh, in the cold floor because that's where cold comes from. So anyways, that's the insulation part of it. I gave Nate a little treat and built him a deck. Uh, what did I do it? Looks like six feet by 10 feet treated lumber and just set it in front. Didn't even screw it to the bunkie, just have it sitting there, which is kind of nice. Little uh, added touch. So for value of this thing, the lumber was the nicest lumber I've ever worked with. It was grade A, straight, barely a knot in it. Very, very, very nice stuff. They must have milled it. It's kiln dried, kiln dried obviously. Beautiful stuff. Uh, so that was really nice to work with. For the price point, um, so it's where, where I would say this is of value to you is if you don't have any building construction experience, you can do this yourself. You, they didn't need me except for perfectly square and level kind of deck for it. And then, you know, checking things as we go. So 
like there, there's a lot of gaps in the doors and windows around the frame, how, how they do that because it does move around and expand and contract this type of construction. So, you know, I had to square all the doors and windows, make sure they open properly. After it settles and does its thing and moves around, I might have to make some little adjustments. Squaring it when we get to the second level, checking for levels, uh, proper building techniques, you know, for for the metal and how to do metal properly and things. But other than that, you can build it yourself. So if you don't have any building experience and you can follow instructions or you've ever made an Ikea package or something, piece of furniture, you can build one of these things. So, and it's a great little uh, starter build too. You can kind of learn about it. And I've never built tongue and groove like log a log cabin before. I knew how to do it, so it was kind of almost new to me. Would I do something differently? So if I was to look for a bunkhouse or something, um, but keep in mind I'm I'm a little crazy too. But I was looking at these rig mats that uh, are used in the oil field. So they're eight by twenty and eight by forty steel frames this is also what atco office trailers and home trailers and things are used they're standard so any semi with a winch and roller can can winch on and lift them up and the steel frame is super solid and it also kind of protects it from torquing too like if one side's lower when you build it it's all together but i like i like standard construction i like building a wall insulation vapor barrier then you can put electrical in it um, things and then you can finish the outside if you want to make a building look like a log cabin you can build it standard insulated vapor barrier wired polypans on all the electrical build it a little more high efficient things like that and then buy a whole bunch of nice lumber it's going to cost you more and it's going to take you a lot lot longer but uh, so this thing kind of is what it is you build it in two three days you know two three long days and you have a finished structure that's good right so um yeah it is cute as a button as well i could foresee not just for um you know uh, shtf or whatever but uh i could foresee you putting one of these on your property and what's great in most jurisdictions of the government you don't need a permit under 100 square feet so permitless build one of these things if you had access to a bathroom building or an outhouse or a sauna or an outdoor shower and a few kind of amenities like that, um, like if uh, Nate and I might might uh, continue this series on hi mostly his channel, but I might build an outhouse or a latrine. I might build an outdoor shower. I might build a small greenhouse, uh, efficient greenhouse for this um, and do a bunch of cool things and make this a micro homestead. But this Airbnb, if you need to make make some money, like you can buy one of these bunkies, assemble it in a few days, put in a few extra amenities, right? You could do a couple solar panels, a little solar generator, a couple different heat sources Nate and I are probably going to do. Like there's, you can get a diesel exhausting um, little uh, heater, whatever that they use for hashtag van life like an S-bar heater or something. I think Viver sells one as well. You can get a venting propane furnace. And I say venting because a little structure like this, you don't want to have something not venting and then have a risk of carbon monoxide. Uh, wood stove. I'm a super fan of all my buildings have wood stoves. For something tiny like this, I'd have to really see. It's got to be a tiny wood stove. I actually have stored away a small antique cast iron wood cook stove that's got the hot plates on but just a small fire chamber so in those old wood wood stoves most of the heat goes to the cooking not so much the heating and that might be perfect for this but i mean it's all kind of up to nate um what he wants to do but you could airbnb this and make make some cash like people would would love this a little in nature it's cute, it's quaint, you can come out here, turn your phone off, listen to the birds, like listen to nature. This is in nature, we are, we're in a natural land around here. It, it's, it's a beautiful experience. I, might, I should just come and sit, see if I can force myself to sit out here for a day 
or a half a day. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I got to do stuff. If memory serves me correct, Bunky Life said this is about a three and a half season building. So not in the dead of winter. Now it gets very, very cold where we live. But when the pioneers came over, they'd build a sod or log structure and survived in it. What they had to do is it's not an efficient building, is have a small heat source going kind of more frequently if that makes sense, or all the time, like a wood stove literally going all the time. So this reminds me of kind of a better pioneer-ish cabin, right? So you could survive in the winter, no problem. Uh, if you wanted a little off-grid thing, like there's no plumbing in it, no electric, but you solar panels, a little um, solar generator, build your own little solar system so you can have fans, lights, a few little amenities. And then I was thinking for uh, for our harsh climate, probably the best way to clean yourself and to be cleanly is to do a sauna, wood-fired sauna. So why those aren't as more common in Canada, I don't know. Like in Sweden, that's the first thing they build on their homestead. So when you go into a sauna, steamy sauna, it opens up your pores, and then just with a bucket of water, you wash yourself. So it opens your pores, and you're washing out your pores. You get a better clean than a shower anyways. So you could do a sauna for cleanliness and hygiene next to one of these. Then you don't even need a shower, really. Um, and then a latrine or an outhouse, obviously. And you could survive four seasons in here. Okay, back to more building science. You sick of me yet? I'm just talking and I'm all over the place. My brain is. Anyway. Um, okay, building science. I have built lots of ice fishing shacks over the years. My last one I built, the nicest one, was light enough uh, two guys could lift it into the box of a truck. It was eight feet by eight feet, but it had a bench, and the base was just a four by eight sheet of plywood. I built that out of three eighths thick spruce, no insulation, no extras, so it's light and portable, and a metal roof with no sheeting on the top, I don't even think I did. And uh, anyways, this 8x8 eight eight thing with a bench on both sides, I put this tiny little stove in. And ice fishing in minus 40 Celsius or minus 30 Celsius, you have a wood stove in there, you cook yourself out of it. It's insane. And ice fishing, you're in and out the door, you know, a hundred times or the door is wide open. You're sitting there with the wood stove going and, you know, a jacket or a sweater on. And you leave the doors on each side I put open because it's too damn hot in there. Now, that, because it's such a small little building, that's three-eighths spruce plywood I built that ice shack. So this is inch-and-a-half dimensional lumber that has, you know, an R-value, just the wood of two. It, it, I essentially had zero R-value in that ice shack, and it still worked. But you need to keep a small little fire going all the time. If the fire goes out, it's going to be the same temperature inside as outside. So with a structure like this, it reminds me of an ice shack or an older home or a little pioneer cabin. What you need is a small heat source that goes more frequently instead of a big heat source like a, a house. Maybe you have a big wood stove in. You can throw some big logs on and overnight are logs and they burn all night. And then the next morning you have a fire or something. Uh, something like this you need that doesn't work um, so they have little sailboat wood stoves I don't know if Nate sells any but I had one called a cubic mini wood stove they're super super tiny they're built for essentially drying out sailboats and providing a little heat um, the problem with that okay so a sailboat hashtag van life people little bunkhouse people they run into this problem for heating these things the heat source needs to be small or you literally cook yourself out of the darn van or sailboat or building. But a little wood stove, it doesn't burn very long. So literally every 45 minutes, you'd have to put like wood in this little wood stove. Because if you had a bigger fire, put in bigger sticks, you're going to cook yourself out of this place. So for something like this, that's not super efficient, but is small, a better option I am thinking would be some sort of other fuel. So a propane... Um, maybe a propane little tiny fireplace, the smallest one you can get. 
So it's going to just sip propane or, or a diesel one, sip diesel, um, but run more frequently so you're not cooking yourself out or freezing in there because there's no in between on a little structure. That's why I always say um, with building science, a bigger building is actually far superior to a little shack be, uh, because it's got more mass to it. So in my greenhouse, the sun heats it up. It's 3,000 square feet, heats up all this concrete and water, and then it releases it at night. You can't really do that with a little tiny building. Those little S-bar heaters that are in uh, semi-cabs and stuff, they just sip diesel. The van life people, they put a little S-bar or a Wabasso or something, or Viver sells one. It just sips diesel. I think it's like a gallon of diesel a day or something it would probably take to, to do a semi-cab or something like this, or a van. So that is what I would do for a heat source, but I'd also put a wood stove back up. And finally, what you've probably been waiting for the whole video, let me give you a tour. So this is the Bunky Life Haven Ultra model. It's a little over 10 feet by 10 feet footprint. The loft sticks out a little bit. And it is, I keep saying and Nate hates it, cute as a button. Absolutely cute as a button. But uh, you can tell him I, I said it was badass. This lumber is just absolute grade A beautiful stuff, right? And again, the natural oils are coming out. Like, it is a good feeling with all this natural wood. I love the feeling of like log cabin and, and natural wood finish. The whole back, you can get extra windows or I was thinking about cutting in a window um, because uh, the white-tailed deer are right over there. Um, <laughs> cutting in a window there or whatever to get a cross breeze, but um, the whole back is just solid lumber. You could cut in a door, uh, other things like that, but it fits together very, very snug. Very, very snug. Uh, use those hammer blocks and again the joints are going to expand contract but it's like a double tongue and groove thing and you know it, it is I can push on it and it's kind of it's got give like it is what it is it's not as strong as a house or nothing uh, this is the the footing so uh, concrete block there asphalt shingles to shim right and you can I literally put a little stick there, um, my little pry bar, and can lift it up with one hand, take out a shingle, put shingles back. It doesn't matter, right? The whole thing is going to be moving anyways. It is is what it is. Uh, we decided to do the doors open from the outside for the main floor ones. So essentially, they I think they build these. It is double pane, though, which is nice. And they do put a half decent seal on. They said to put the screens to the outside. These are unfortunately fixed screens, which I, I didn't like. But, uh, and then they put their weather stripping when they make them, give you a nice looking latch. But uh, it looked the same material and weatherproofing inside to outside. So we opened them from the outside because it's a small footprint inside. Nice, cute latch or if Nate's listening, it's a bad, bad, or awesome prepper latch. No, it's cute. And same with these, we open them to the outside. I'm gonna put a little hook here to hold the, the thing, but I just put a chair. Um, as opposed to inside, the window height's lower than a couch, so if you wanted a piece of furniture there, um, uh, da -da 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 -da, the window would be in the way that where you can't open it. And again, I think they build their own doors, or they must. And uh, it seals up okay. Okay, you, you install the doors and windows as you're doing it. Okay, so you build like the wall halfway up, and then at a certain point, the instructions say to slip the door in. There is a lot of play, a lot of air gap in between there and the windows. And that's, they say, for expansion contraction. So I, to secure the door, I just essentially used some screws to suck it 
in and out and square it. But then again, as the building shrinks or gets bigger, or does its thing, that maybe the doors and windows don't close as good. So then I um, uh, will have to make an adjustment. But uh, and the door opening to the outside as well. Okay. Well, there's the uh, Katana Boy Silky Saw I got from Nate. Oh man, that thing is sweet. CanadianPreparedness.com for that thing. That is a must-have prepper tool. Okay, so this is, uh, it's hard, probably kind of hard to film 10 by 10 little thing, but it is cute as a button. Okay, so the inside is the same as the outside. All the wall is, is dimensional, beautiful grade A lumber like this. So here's, here's a little knot and you see, you can see the outside in it, right? Okay, now this is gonna shrink and, but, but they, they're, they're milling how they put this together. Like there's no light or any air coming through there. Uh, so what I'm gonna do, let this breathe. I have the doors open all the time. Let this breathe inside, outside, let the wood release all its oils and uh, do its thing. And then use a penetrating oil stain is what I'm thinking. And then come back and caulk a few things. There are windows that they built. It's just kind of a one by four frame. I'm thinking about uh, next year taking all the screws out. And like I said, there's probably half an inch or three quarters of an inch of just air around the border for expansion contraction on a little, this type of building. So I might take those off and put in some fiberglass insulation in there just to kind of seal that up a little better because that's just a one by four board that's exposed to the elements almost. So the upper floor joists or floor system, these are the joists that they come with. They tongue and groove and lock it all together. And then this is tongue and groove um, uh, floor up there, but also the finished ceiling. So everything is both floor or ceiling or outside and inside, no insulation to it type of thing. There's a white tailed deer I shot literally 25 yards away. And that coyote was about from here, 300 yards away last winter. Okay, the stairs slash ladder it comes with. It's kind of a steep system up there. To get uh, furniture up there, you gotta make sure that it fits, but it looks like folding folding beds or assemble stuff up there. So I'll take you, go ahead and look. And again, it just smells and feels nice in here. This natural wood. There's a railing that the kit comes with. The main beams and they put them this way for essentially ease of construction. Okay. So I can stand up comfortably in the middle of it. Let me back up here. So there's, my head is about here. And we open these windows to the inside because you can't reach them from the outside. I put one of my military cots in to kind of see the size of it. But it looks like, Bruno, leave the coyote alone. It looks like um, uh, it's best to have your walkway in the middle because of the head height and have a twin or a double bed here, here, maybe another one here. But there is uh, significant room. So uh, how much more is it? Three feet more about than, so this is 10 by 13 up here. Nice size. And again, all exposed grade A lumber, spruce, beautiful. Now what I was talking about condensation was, Bunky Life Kit just comes with, this is half inch I believe, tongue and groove boards for the roof. So this is this and then outside and then you put whatever roof you want on. So for screwing on the tin, I had to pre-drill and make sure it hits all these beams, the wall, this beam, this, and this, uh, or else you'd have screws coming through. And actually, see, somebody missed one. I gotta cut that off. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, not like a standard stick framing or nothing. Uh, everything's finished, you have to watch where your screws are. 
But anyways, it's already, it's warmer up here than it is down uh, in the main floor, um, even with this, this uh, window open. It would be nice to have another another window if you're getting one for a cross breeze, or you can chainsaw in your own window if you want. Okay, so condensation. When you have a heat source in here in the winter, heat's going to rise. It's not going to condensate here. It's going to condensate. If you just put metal and no insulation, it's going to condensate under the metal. Um, if you put insulation, it's going to condensate on the warm side of the insulation, likely a little bit. So you have to put house wrap right on this. Insulation on that, so if condensation will go down the house wrap, the house wrap just protects the wood structure. Insulation and then your tin, right? So, so this is forever, you know, waterproof and stuff like that. And then a uh, wood penetrating, I'm thinking oil finish uh, every few years on the outside to protect it from the elements. See, we missed another screw. That was me because I did all the high stuff outside. Whoops. But uh, yeah, lots of room for sleeping. I, I foresee this uh, a nicer place to be in the late fall and even in the winter to have a little wood stove in here and a nap or just cooler in here, a nice cool sleep. Man, this is gonna be nice. <coughs> Bruno, leave the coyote alone. Yeah, I figured this was good. I got him last year, or last winter. Kind of, because that's where the monkey is. Yeah. Uh, I, just leaving it up to Nate kind of thing to decide. I don't want to overstep anything, but I got a little, my little 12 volt cooler when we were working. It's still out here. But uh, for wiring, you're going to have to surface wire it. So if we do solar panels, I'm just going to run either outside or inside to the battery packs or charge controllers and figure that out. Maybe it would be nice because this is kind of like a bunkhouse sleeping shack to put a futon or another place to sleep on the main floor. Maybe you come here yourself. It's really hot uh, summer day and you don't want to... Uh, cook yourself out. You just have a little nap down here. Uh, I'm thinking a wood stove. I'll have to cover up some of this beautiful lumber with concrete board or metal to protect it. Wood stove probably, probably here. A little wood cook stove would be nice. Maybe we'll uh, send it out the side and up the side on the exterior and up, up past the roof. Something like that. But uh, yeah, I don't want to overstep and we can furnish this nice. You could hide some storage up here, put little shelves. If, if you make this kind of your control panel and little cooking area was my thoughts, maybe you have a little sh shallow shelf, a bunch of hooks for your cast iron cookware, stuff like that maybe. But uh, the options are endless. And I like the look of natural wood. Okay, when staining, Okay, I, I did galvalume because it's uh, metal on the roof because it's light in color and it reflects the light. Okay, a little thing like this in the summertime, you do not want to heat up. Dark stain is very nice, but I don't do any of my buildings dark in color because the sun, it would literally be 10 degrees hotter in here if you had dark, or 20 degrees if you did dark stain. Plus, I like the natural wood, so I just want a protection of it to try to keep the natural appearance, especially in the outside. And the painting guys I talked to, I'm scared to like do an oil penetrating outside and nothing inside because it would, could affect the wood, how the wood expands, contracts and whatever. So I'd like a good penetrating stain, do the inside and the outside, like literally everything. I'll come in with a sprayer and, and do a bunch of stuff. But this is a nice place to hang out. So we'll probably build them a, a, a fire pit there for some outside cooking. I built him a couple uh, picnic tables, a kid's one and a big one. And yeah, this is nice. Uh, you can have the door open when it's raining and the windows open. 
So they, this is well designed. You get a little covering from the elements. So it poured rain last night. That's why I have time to do a video. This window is open. No water in here, right? But CP and me. It's even got uh, Saskatoon berries, wild Saskatoon berries right next to it. We left all intact. So cool. Um, anyway, so what was my overall experience with this? It went together quick, actually longer than I figured, but uh, very, very quick. All the lumber was the best lumber I've ever worked with. Um, price point is decent. Like the cost of doing anything is crazy so the price point for this and you get a finished unit essentially is very very good if you wanted to build a 10 by 10 shack that looks like this but it has is sheeted built with two by four walls insulated vapor barriered and then wanted to make it look like this you're talking more money and a whole lot of work right so this is what it is and again with a small structure do you really need insulation and vapor barrier you're going to run out of oxygen probably when you're sleeping so this kind of it is what it is it is cute as a button so for myself with building knowledge i would uh, i'm thinking those rig mats and building a shack out of that but again it's a little bit bigger than this and then I might even put a small air exchanger in those. Um, it's just kind of nice to control it. But again, it's going to cost me a lot more money than, uh, than this thing. And this thing is perfectly fine. So, so if, you need a, if I need a nap or something and Nate's not using it and need to get away from the kids, this will be my little vacation. I can walk over here, take the golf cart. Life is good. So. I believe uh, Bunky Life gave Nate a... Uh, promo code to save you $500 on shipping or something so I'll put that in the link to, to my video and I'll put the links to the two videos he's done so far but you can check out his channel uh, Canadian Prepper um, on YouTube uh, for the couple videos he's done and upcoming videos so I'm sure as he decks this thing out with all the prepper gear and we kind of finish it and figure out the best way to build this little micro homestead he'll be doing lots of videos and I'll be doing lots of videos as well hopefully that wasn't too long-winded but thanks for watching <laughs>